Welcome to Elmo's World Podcast. And this is Elmo, guys. And I have my awesome guest here, Mark Phillips. Can you introduce yourself, Mark? Sure. Thank you, Elmo. I, I look forward to being here. I think we'd tried to, uh, to have a discussion some time ago and things didn't work out, but I'm glad to finally meet up with you and have a conversation. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I live in uh, Southern Ohio on the, uh, uh, in a small town on the Ohio river where Kentucky, West Virginia, and Ohio meet or close to it. Uh, I teach at a local Bible college, Tri-State Bible College. It's been around for a little over 50 years. I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm on the faculty, teach apologetics and uh, intro to philosophy. And so I, I actually work in administration at my local church. I'm an administrator, um, <clears throat> which means I make a lot of coffee and I bother the pastors as much as I can. <laughs> so... So, and then I like having conversations. Uh, that's just that's just one of the things that I do. I, I'm speaking at a conference a uh, week from tomorrow that our, our college is having. We're, we're located in a region of, of the United States known as Appalachia. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Appalachia before. It's a, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's an area, a region of 13 states that is dominated by uh, small mountains. They're, compared to the Rocky Mountains, they're more like uh, big hills, but they're, it's a mountainous region where access is limited uh, mm -hmm. by highway and where poverty has been chronic for a uh, better part of a century. It's one of the earliest regions settled in the U.S. by, uh, by pioneers, by Europeans pushing westward. Um, it's got uh, some interesting issues that have uh, stuck around for generations. Uh, people are typically poor. Uh, we, we have a the city right across the river from me is Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, it's got a terrible uh, drug problem with both uh, prescription narcotics and heroin abuse. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's not a very wealthy region of the country. So it, it's, it's like a, an isolated area that uh, uh, is behind in certain respects to the rest of the U.S., but now that internet is here, um, we have our same old problems, but everyone seems to like, <laughs> like TikTok you, and everything you, else. Yeah, so, you really got you know. the details on the location. You, you're a very good, probably a very good writer, you know, very good uh, descriptions and everything. <laughs> right, right. It's so, awesome. it, but we do. We we have a lot of. Uh, it, it is a conference on Appalachia. I'll be speaking on uh, critical theory and critical race theory. So, mm -hmm. and uh, it's so it's just it's a it's been a good place to live and raise my family and and so now here I am talking to you. So, all so right, it's all awesome. good. Awesome, awesome. Okay, well, um, Mark, I can you can I ask you why? you are a christian and why do you think it's the the most viable belief system to believe in okay in, in a nutshell yeah in a nutshell. excuse me I, I was raised in a christian home mm -hmm. um, when i went to college at ohio state uh after after college i kind of grew my hair out and played in a band awesome. um we played a lot of uh, was it a christian band or like just secular uh, no no it was secular okay um we we like i we've been to a lot of concerts you know i went to see rush and queens reich and uh, all sorts of of more progressive or metal bands and 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 i did that for the better part of i don't know a decade and a half um and then i decided i finally wanted to earn some money mm -hmm. <laughs> so so i i got a real job and uh and eventually wound up getting married um <laughs> how, and then, how old were you how old were you when you decided to uh earn some money uh let's see i was probably closer to 30. I okay think. <laughs> okay i still have time I'm still yeah there's plenty of time <laughs> so yeah. so the what what eventually happened i I wasn't as serious about my faith. I didn't walk away entirely, but it just wasn't important to me at the time. Um, then when I, uh, 
got married and had kids, I realized that I was going to have to bring them up somehow mm -hmm. in some manner of an ethical way to be good citizens and, uh, and actually uh, do well for themselves. So that's when I kind of got serious about, about uh, my faith again. And then I realized as I was working at my church, I realized that there were uh, things that I didn't know. Um, remarkably, a, a large number of things I didn't know about Christianity, and I went through a crisis of faith. I actually uh, would, would teach little kids at church and then come home and stare at the ceiling, not able to sleep, uh, wondering if it was all true. Um, you know, I would speak of the resurrection of Jesus and then go home and wonder how someone could raise, you know, could come back to life from the dead. So mm -hmm. that, um, that led me into studying some things about apologetics. And at that point I was still, it could have gone either way. Um, I mean, I, I really came very close to walking away from faith, mm -hmm. but after, after the, uh, certain things uh, that I was able to study and connect the dots and uh, on just a whole number of different fields uh, kind of led me to where I am today. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I do, I do teach high school students at my church uh, aspects of uh, apologetics and Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there, I, I don't know how convinced they are. I think I've been doing this long enough that I've seen a change in attitudes and knowledge, epistemology and uh, education level. I've noticed that once cell phones and tablets became more a part of everyday life, that, um, that these students I have now, um, they're smart they're just so focused, I think, on what they learn through their phone that they're not necessarily connected to the bigger picture of the world around them. Um, they, they seem to have not a whole lot of knowledge about Ukraine or what's going on in the war. Because mm -hmm. I, I asked him point blank. I said, what, you guys have any reaction to uh, Russia invading Ukraine? And and they were just kind of ambivalent about it, which kind of surprised me because, you know, when I, when I was their age and when I was younger than when you were now, uh, I grew up in a time when we, we seriously thought the Russians were going to nuke us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, war. we, yeah, the cold war. We, I mean, we seriously, and that was the end of the whole duck and cover. I don't know if you ever seen those videos of school kids hiding under their desks Mm -hmm. uh, thinking that that would protect them from a nuclear bomb. That's just part of being an American, I guess, you know? So, so it was just, uh, it's just kind of an interesting gig that I've got now that I've, I'm older and, and, uh, you know, I don't have any kids at home. I can teach and, uh, and go to conferences and pretty much hang out and then talk to, uh, talk to you on the internet. So. Can I ask you, like, do you think that there is enough evidence for someone to believe that that it is real that christianity is real you know or or it, does it have to have some sort of faith like like not super blind faith but more of just you have to take a leap of faith to believe in it well you know that's a that is a great question uh because i i think you know that i would answer in the affirmative yes but there is enough evidence I, I would think yes. That, that, I, I, that, that wouldn't necessitate a leap of faith in in any situ in any case anymore. You just when you see just when you see the evidence, you just say, "Oh, it's enough. I'm going to be a Christian." You don't need like a leap of faith to do it. Well, one one of the courses that I actually teach at the Bible College is general revelation which is the evidence for the existence of God mm -hmm. uh, that is present in the world. Now, because you bring up a great question, because I've had interactions before in person and on Facebook about the nature of evidence. Okay. So you, many times I've noticed that uh, my friends uh, in the atheistic community um, to them, since the universe is a closed system, 
uh, many times they will ask for physical evidence or, or let me say empirical evidence. Okay. Which would be some sort of physical data or detectable, uh, something material from the world. Um, the issue comes that there's a little bit of a category error in that. The, the issue is that yeah, as, as Christian belief holds, uh, God does not have a physical body. So in the sense that you wouldn't use a metal detector to look for plastic, uh, you can't make the assumption that plastic doesn't exist just because your metal detector doesn't pick it up. Um, that's just a very weak analogy here. So if you're looking for physical evidence for God, um, uh, we're not going to, I'm, I'm not going to get into things like intelligent design or anything like that. Um, if God is immaterial, he's going to have to be detectable some other way. Because it can't it can't be through photography or video or how can we like uh, detect God then? Well, that the evidence would have to come from different types of reasoning. Uh, you'd have to, um, you know, if, if you look at the ancient Greeks, uh, for example, Aristotle and Plato. Plato looked at for the good um, because Plato believed that there had to be an ultimate. Uh, um, uh, I don't want to say cause, but an ultimate uh, source for the uh, universe in a sense. And it would have to be good based on uh, the nature of life itself. Aristotle went for the idea of the first cause or the, the uh, unmoved mover, uh, that there couldn't be an infinite past in the world and that the universe had to come from somewhere. There couldn't be an infinite regress. So now we're into the area of philosophy. And I do know that, um, uh, that there are individuals that will probably listen to your show or listen to this show and say, well, uh, philosophy uh, isn't evidence or it isn't as strong evidence as, say, empirical data. And that, that raises a question, though, uh, because if just because the universe is very large scale, the question becomes, where did the universe come from? And that's where you get a lot of, you find a lot of the apologetics arguments for the origin of the universe. Uh, it, it either comes down to the multiverse or God. Um, there is no physical evidence for the multiverse. There might be some mathematics, but now we've less, left empirical data for mathematics and we don't have proof of a multiverse. So um, that to me kind of is where that whole argument ends up. You have to choose between uh, fancy math and trying to prove a multiverse that cannot be proven beyond Planck time, uh, that, that briefest of moments after um, the explosion of the universe back to the singularity or God. And so if, if we can't have an infinite regress of time, it's got to be one of those two things. And based on other types of evidences outside of empiricism or naturalism, um, that's why I fall on the side of theism and God existing. Okay, uh, so it's more of the, the thinking about the cosmology, like cosmology right. of things, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. So when you, so when you talk about like um, philosophical arguments that would be enough to prove that God exists, or at, or at least that Christianity itself exists, right? You actually haven't really told me anything. You only men you only mentioned that there's two. It's probably like binary, multiverse, like fancy math, or or uh, or deist creator. Right, but that's that that's not even enough to lead to Christianity. So I don't really see any like really strong evidence that's actually convincing. Like, okay. What do you say? Well, let's see. I I am I am trained in in classical apologetics. Um, I would not pronounce Christianity. Uh, I would not say we we haven't gotten to Christianity yet. We're just okay. looking at the first cause. Okay. Um, 
actually, before we even get to that, we, we would have to discuss if there is such a thing as, as truth mm -hmm. is and, and what the definition of truth is. When, what I most feared before was having myself be trapped in a Dunning-Kruger situation, you know, mm -hmm. where I mean, if I think that I, I'm right, how would I know? If I'm wrong, if I if I, I if I you know if I just have this assumptions and never really question what were my own situation, and and that was where I, I I actually accepted that the the many problems that I faced in when I was a Christian it it, it just it, there were challenges that that I faced but I I just couldn't put a put an answer to the, those holes you know. So one of, one of them is the I guess the problem of of free will. Uh, I I just couldn't think think of why God would would risk us having free will when when there's a possibility that that billions of people will go to hell. Like in that was that was how it appeared to me. You know when you think about Adam mm -hmm. and Eve and and god seeing everything in, in in hindsight you know it ju it, ju it i just can't can't think of of it as a as a an actual thing a god would do if he is perfect right so so if if god is not perfect or if it's actually not good then he probably isn't real but but I left Christianity other not not just for that one reason but many so I I just I took it an as an overall and and like multiple aspects of it, uh, so that's where that but that was one of the the challenges that I faced right like it, it God chose to give to make give Adam any free will, right? But he mm -hmm. knew that there was a possibility that billions of people would go to hell. At the end of it, like after Revelation and everything, so I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't see how that would be worth it, you know. Maybe, maybe at the end of Revelation, there's like six billion people in heaven, but but at the end of it, there's like twice or even triple people like suffering eternity in hell. So I don't know, but that's why I, I became an, an annihilationist when I was a. Uh, when I was still a Christian, like at at the at almost the at the near the end of the line, but I still couldn't grasp it. What what, what do you say about that? Well, would have you? Uh, let me just ask a question. Mm -hmm. Have you moved towards determinism then? Um, do yes. you view our, our actions as okay? Yeah, but it's but I do admit. Right, that I'm still in a state of cognitive dissonance where I know that there's some things that I believe that don't make sense and, and definitely contradict. That's why, and nihilism is not a good state to be in. <laughs> that's where I am at. And uh, that's why I'm actually, I would love for you to tell me, like, if there's a problem in, in what I believe, and, and uh, I, I want to tackle it, everything, you know, I don't want to just ignore it. Okay, well, let me let me uh, ask another question here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in in the U.S., in our judicial system, our judicial system is based on the premise that um, that everyone does have free will. Because if if we didn't have free will, then uh, criminals could not be charged for their crimes because they were determined to do their actions. Oh, hey, Mark, I apologize. Yeah, so you were talking about the uh, justice system? Right, we were talking about uh, determinism. Yeah. Well, well, believing in free will just because it's necessary to have a justice system doesn't really prove that there, there, there actually is free will, right? No, it does not. But yeah. that being said... Um, if, if, let's say if someone were to uh, steal everything you had, mm -hmm. if they were determined to do that, uh, you'd have no 
reason or no right to get mad at them if it's just determined. So, so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think it's in this. I'm just speaking. I'm not, mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I don't think anyone could actually live, uh, in complete agreement with their beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, I think there would be cognitive dissonance in that, in that case to keep acting as if we don't have free will. Mm -hmm. um, well, there is uh, a perspective, right? Where, mm -hmm. where they do admit that r human rights, dignity, uh, the value of life, truth, justice are, are simply social constructs, right? And everything is just a power struggle, which it mostly is, you know. And so, but in order to survive as a species, we need these social constructs in order to to uh, uphold our society. So, even though there is no such thing, it, it is very useful, and so that's why pe uh, people people uphold it, right? Right, right. The the thing is, you know, if if you would hold to that. Mm -hmm. then there was nothing wrong with the Russians invading R Ukraine. Because if they were determined so to... Do, do you think it, the Rus Russians are objectively wrong in invading Ukraine? Yes, I, w I would mm -hmm. think so. Well, for a number of... Because the... Um, uh, if you look at the trials of Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. um, for example the the russians french americans british conducted the tribunals in germany at nuremberg uh under german law it was legal um genocide was legal against the jews at the time but when judge uh, robert jackson of the u.s who led the the trials established that whatever the Germans did, it was a crime against humanity. Um, whatever humanity is, that's, that's a philosophical term. Um, so whatever they did was injurious. And, and, and Jackson held to the belief that there was an overarching transcendent law that whatever the Germans did, they violated this notion that all human beings have value, and it's a transcendent notion that is not rooted in social constructs. Um, that's, that's one of the issues of history that kind of gets neglected. What, whatever the Germans did during World War II, uh, uh, did injure within a portion of humanity that thing that makes them human. Um, so, so all of the Nuremberg trials are based on the idea that law and morality are not social constructs, that they are objectively, that they were objectively violating uh, this knowledge of right and wrong that all humans possess. So, so again, I, I know we've been discussing the justice system, and that wasn't necessarily the point of tonight. Um, but that, that's uh, just to kind of move the conversation along. That's, I, I do think there's enough uh, behaviors that we can't consistently live with the idea that, that it's just a social construct and there are no ob objective moral truths. So that would be another issue for probably another time but i don't want to bog down here i see so, okay yeah. yeah uh so talking about christianity again so you were the so it was a sense of justice right that it's that free will is necessary for justice that's why we have to have free will well i i think a lot of people feel that the world could be better and if the world could be better, that means that people would have a choice to make it better. Um, otherwise, we're stuck, and and now we're back to nihilism, um, fatalism, and and mm -hmm. so I I just I think there is a desire. I think there's a worldwide 
and I could be wrong. I mean, but I think there's a worldwide desire to see what's happening in the Ukraine stop and to see what other countries around the world are doing to have them stop. And even my own government here in the U.S., there are people who wishes that the U.S. might do some things that they stop. And so there's a, you know, there is a desire for something better. Mm -hmm. And it seems to, again, I'm going to get back to this word transcendent. It seems to desire something that is almost just out of our reach. Um, out of reach? What do yeah. you mean? Like, uh, like there's something better that we could, uh, as a species, get a hold of. That, when you say uh, better, like it, it would have been better if Russia di just didn't invade Ukraine, is what you're saying? Well, that that's that's not the only problem in the world. That is one of them, but it would it would help. Um, mm. Okay. Well, do you think that uh, uh, Russia invading Ukraine was immoral? Like because you're talking about a transcendent, overarching like sense of morality, right? That that the world is believing that it was wrong for Russia to invade Ukraine. So do you think the, their invasion was itself was immoral? <clears throat> well, I yes, I think warfare mm -hmm. in this case, uh, particularly the targeting of civilians. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but what if is, the the civilians are are just collateral damage? That that is, I I find that a harsh term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, that that's the well. How about in Iraq, Afghanistan? You know, there are so many other countries where NATO right. or the U.S. have have come in with a sense where their with their sense of of overarching uh, morality. You know that where they where they believe that they are in the right but there were, were collateral damages right civilians hurt as well right there's i i think there are some questions about the legitimacy of the wars the u.s has conducted since world war ii um world war ii we were directly attacked my my father was a veteran of world war ii um, um but every every you know, our next action was in Korea, which was viewed as a, a police action because, again, this potential spread of um, communism to the Korean Peninsula. And so uh, it, you've hit upon an issue in our country that a lot of people um, have questions about. Um, there are a lot of questions about Vietnam. We still have a number of Vietnam veterans still alive here in our country. Uh, you look at the other countries, such as France, that was in Vietnam before the United States, and and what what issues plagued their attempts, um, and that goes back to the uh, the days of uh, colonialism and our recent military actions elsewhere. You know, our country went and got involved in Afghanistan, and 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 the pullout was messy. Um, and and that's part of the issue with uh, one of the things in the U.S. government here is our government tends to want to throw money at uh, problems, and from a top-down strategy to make those problems go away and that is not always an effective way of doing things uh for example this this region of the country that uh that i live in 60 years ago president johnson uh spent uh millions and upwards of a couple billion dollars to try to uh, bring this region of the country out of poverty and it generally yeah. failed well, well, um, I, I noticed this. Like, um, I watched this video on on YouTube where where it it had they had a, a clip, uh, like a, a montage of clips of reportage in Western media where it, it uh, sort of displayed some sort of racism in terms of the 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 world's treatment of of the Ukrainian invasion, 
right? Like w- w- there were people, there were uh, uh, guests on on BBC like mentioning uh, that uh, they, they just these are they just can accept that people with blue eyes or in blonde hair were were suffering like this, you know, or mm. or that the treatment of of Ukrainian refugees in comparison to those from Middle East, the Middle East and how much Europe welcomed them it compared compared to being just to be to others who are who had close borders close borders against mid, middle eastern people mm-hmm. so that was a that was something that i noticed that that it was racism seems seem to be systematic here would would you would you agree <clears throat> there there are bits of uh, systemic I, I'm actually speaking on that in a week from tomorrow mm-hmm. um, at, at a conference here uh, there there are issues in in systemic racism that um, lurk beneath the surface uh, one of the problems is our that I'm sensing here in the in the states is there's there are issues with the media uh controlling what gets seen so there are times i i try to find information about the ukraine and and i get information from certain perspectives um but it seems like um with regards to the the middle eastern refugees let's take a look at that i i have a cousin who is a christian missionary in europe on the mediterranean and he actually works with uh, Muslim ref- refugees coming into Europe to help them find housing and teach them English and provide for their basic needs. Um, he's actually rather, uh, he's gotten busy uh, doing this. He's established networks across the, the Middle East for, um, for connections. Um, so he would he would agree that that media coverage seems to uh, kind of kind of vary in their presentation of what's going on. Um, I here's a, here's an odd statistic for you. Um, I don't know if you've heard this or not. They're um, missionaries are reporting that approximately 23 percent of muslims that are becoming christian that they uh that are converting to christianity that about 23 percent of them are experiencing an encounter with jesus in their dreams and and i have done a little research on that and my cousin in europe confirms that um He's met several former uh, Muslims who who are now professing Christ based on what they maintain. Now, this is this is their experience. You know, no one else can have this this the phenomenon of this experience except these people. But they have left Islam for Christianity. Um, uh, be, that would be a, an interesting guest for you to have on sometime is someone who's who's a missionary who can neither uh, vouch for that statistic or or put that one to bed. That's uh, that is that is something that is in, intriguing me. Um, but I've heard it from multiple sources. I've had a couple validated, but um, I just don't know how you how you go about researching it right now with. Uh, um, with uh, the attitudes of various nations, you know, um, it seems like it seems like the population around the world is getting a little more tribal. Um, so, just something something for you to consider if you want to guest sometime. You might find someone who could speak to that. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> uh, well, uh, actually, like uh, when you, when I think about it, um, I've always been thinking like what would be a better world you know and sometimes i think like uh, the world would be a better place if there was actually 
a one world government you know watching over everyone not just first world countries not just those in in, in europe you know because like for example if you think if you look at north korea Right in in the stories and the narratives about concentration camps and people being tortured, uh, mm-hmm. people being killed on the streets, the hunger, the famine, you know, it, it and er, someone right now right is struggling really hard under a, an evil government, but like but the ha- but half of the world is is just playing video games in enjoying movies you know it, it's mm-hmm. it's it's an evil reality that we live in and um i would say that a uh, necessary necessary govern government watching over us would be good you know and that's that's why i i, I would love cosmopolitanism to, to to reach us everywhere it it just It, but it would be very hard, difficult for I guess for a lot of people, you know, to really push, make, push and make the political structure a reality. And uh, one of the scary things, I guess, about Christianity is that it sort of is against this type of thing, right? Like, uh, well, oh, and you, when you say, oh, it's gonna, it's gonna be the Antichrist, you know, it, there's a negative response to this, and the stigma will probably prevent it. So that's why it's it's it would be really uh, ha- a hard uh, hard thing to face. Well, what do you think about that? Like, do you think we should have a one world government? I I would probably be against a one world government. Um, why not? <clears throat> for the same reason that I I hold more to smaller localized uh governments but smaller yes. localized governments mean that there could be some dictator there that we can't touch you know or and, or, or the not or the world's resources and and n- non-equal distribution of wealth you know it, it accumulates right. to the one percent like the world's income like all of the money is right. in the one percent Do, do you think a, a human dictator that, that ruled the world could rule it fairly? Do you think uh, that's possible? Oh, uh, we could have a system that of government that could be that could have checks and balances. I, I would that would be a, that would be possible if everyone actually like agreed to it. Do you, do you think a um, Do you do you think there would be a person who is morally upright enough to actually rule fairly? I'm well, just thinking. thinking well, off the well, top well, it, it's it, the difference actually with the one world government and and what we have now is just population, right? Like like uh, tw- like a century ago, like the the Earth's population was was like the the population of china and india together or even less mm-hmm. so and when we're not saying anything about about india or or russia or china or america right it's 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 already happening so i i wouldn't say that that but so do you think so what, why would you prefer a lo- lo- just small localized governments instead of one world Because I, <laughs> I think uh, I have. I think humans have a problem mm-hmm. with um, with human nature in general. I I you, I just I just do not see a person. I can see a charismatic person, uh, someone with a lot of charisma, uh, rising to a a seat of power such as one world government and then abusing that i just have a, a difficult time with human nature and and you know i i would say of course the only person who could rule fairly would be christ but again i'm 
taking that from a, a Christian perspective, mm -hmm. even then there would be justice. I mean, someone, someone would have to, uh, it, you know, I, I, I haven't really uh, followed this out to its logical con conclusion yet. I just, um, I think, I think there would be issues. Um, I know there have been good leaders in the world uh, before, but I, I, I think of humans as morally flawed, uh, even the good ones. Um, so, so there have, you know, there have been so, good so, leaders. Uh, but I guess like, if you think about, it, you know, like compared to our situation now, the, the one where government one would be a lot better, right? But of course, there is a possibility that maybe there would be corruption at the top and the, and the world leader will abuse it. But, but I would still say that's still better than what we have now, you know, where, where uh, governments like Russia and China uh, could do whatever they want, you know, in, inside their own country. And I would pref I would actually move towards that, and in, because instead of waiting for for a messiah to save us all, it it that may never come, you know. So if so, what what if it not, doesn't come in the next two thousand years? Then we're we're just gonna are we are, is that did that stop the forefathers from founding uh, a nation that they wanted to make? You know, it it uh, that mindset though is very. It's very difficult. <laughs> I'm sorry for my ideas, man. It's just very no. That's all right. That's right. We're just we're just thinking this yeah. through together. Yeah, I just you know um, even if even if Christ would take another two thousand years, you know, it, it took it took God nineteen hundred years to fulfill His promise to Abraham. Mm -hmm. He's he's not in a hurry. So so you know there are other aspects. You know, depending on on your view of of how eschatology or the study of the end times unfolds from a standpoint of christianity you know there's there's disagreements within the camp on that um you know we're we're coming up on on easter you know which is the holiday for christians you know the belief that that uh, christ died for your sins according to the scriptures was buried and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures mm. um so um i i do not have enough trust in human nature that a human king could be or leader could be morally perfect um maybe i'm cynical in that regard or maybe well, that's I why just, we have checks and balances right in, in a constitutional in, democracy in in theory yes but <laughs> But like, do you think do you think in America right now that a, 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 a dictator could just rise to the to power and 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 control all the all the the free free freedom that America Americans have been protecting the last two hundred years three? Uh, I can I can see I can see changes in the way we do things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I could one of the things about the United States, um, which I, I know there are individuals both in the country and around the world that are upset about that. We have so many firearms in this country. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking, we're talking probably five to six guns per person in yeah. the country at this point, maybe not that many, maybe three or four, but anyway, um uh in in the geographical area it would be difficult but that's another story for another time <laughs> um i just i just don't i there is plenty of room for corruption in this country mm -hmm. there's lots there are lots of of shady deals that go that go on from the top all the way down to the local level um even with the checks and balances, um, I, I find it. Maybe this is because I'm I'm older than you, but but um, uh, I have been let down a lot by putting trust in certain individuals to do things um, in a moral way, and 
and for whatever reason, uh, the moral failings tend to catch up with people. And I just, uh, I, I don't, I have lost my faith in humans to rule and judge correctly. And so I remain much more cynical at my age than you do at your age. And I can understand that. I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. Um, I think, I think you have a fresh view on ideals that we would all like to see happen, but you get to be my age and you get to be real cynical. (laughs) Either that or I'm just a grumpy old man. I haven't figured (laughs) that out yet. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess though that like if we do want to move forward as a as a as a as the you know as the human civilization, it, it would be best to actually want the best for everyone, right? And th- and think of a way to achieve it, even if it does look uh, the future does look a bit look a bit dark, right? It's all yeah. I see. That's that's the you're raising a good question there mm-hmm. because the um, let's say. Uh, Let's say you you get a group, and they don't have to be Christian, but let's say that um, um, perhaps it's it's an offshoot of, of, of Buddhism or Hinduism, and they a world leader comes in, and and the Hindus do not wish to give up their religion, but let's say the world leader is from China who wants um, no aspect of public public uh, religion whatsoever. So who gets who gets to decide what is right and what is wrong when it comes to um, issues of of pursuit of personal religion, for example? Um, you, we see what the Chinese are doing with the Uyghurs, mm-hmm. uh, the Muslim population in the western part of the, of the country, um, uh, and, and I know there's oppression that goes on all over the world. Um, you know, ironically, um, in in Russia, uh, you know, the the revolution was in 1919. Bolsheviks came to power. You know, communism is primarily an, an atheistic system, so uh, a good deal of the Russian Orthodox Church went underground. Um, parents brought their children up secretly in the faith. Um, Then those children taught their children. And then by the time Gorbachev and Yeltsin, um, after the fall of Berlin and the Soviet Union falling apart, there were still a large Russian Orthodox population in Russia, even though public worship had been outlawed. And so, so the thing with, with Christianity is it, it will go underground, uh, much like it's doing in China. There are, um, uh, there are a number of, of secret Christians worldwide who do not display their faith publicly, but have gone literally out of sight, um, um, who will not give up the faith. And I suspect that for other religions, some people may uh, hold to their faith as well. So, so I understand the, the ideal desire for um, working out the world's problems using uh, an approach with government. I just, I have difficulty seeing that actually being implemented unless it's by force or coercion. And I just, I could, I could see a world leader rising who, who um, a number of the world kind of gets fascinated with, and he appears to have great charisma and pathos, and he speaks um, words that unite. But I just, I see the difficulties in that system. I, I don't see that happening in my lifetime. I'm I'm 58. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that's if that's going to happen. It could, 
you never know. Things have a funny way of, of you know, a, a year and a half ago, I didn't expect uh, gasoline prices to be two and a half times what they were. Um, yeah. I, I didn't expect there to be an energy crisis of sorts. Um, didn't expect a, a virus to shut down most of the known world. So I guess things can happen fairly quickly. But I understand. I understand where you're coming from, though. The the whole desire for things to to get better. I'm just. I'm not sold on humanity being able to reach an agreement on that. Yeah, I, I just you know I've I've just been thinking like nationalism, you know, and and the and the borders and everything. It just seems really unne- unnecessary, and just seems to uphold the the systems of power that have been. You know, have been uh, there already. <laughs> it's uh, but uh, but of course, it, that's just me talking, and I don't really. I guess as an nihilist, it doesn't really matter in the end. <laughs> 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 it just seems a kind of fun, you know. <laughs> yeah. But but uh, but uh, when I, I'm I'm a I'm I'm a gamer. I play video games online, and sure. what's really awesome about the internet is is that everyone. Can, is now a citizen of the internet you know if you're in china you could use a vpn if you're in russia you could use a vpn you could still be part of this global you know society online right and in the borders don't matter in the internet you know it's in the, how we treat people it's 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 a lot more different so i i'm sorry it's for me like i'm sort of seeing like kind of a, a how we would it be in the future and how we would act you know that 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 would be best right where where passports aren't necessary and uh well i'm just dreaming <laughs> that that's just how i i wish the world would would be now but of course not the internet of course has a dark side too i i would admit <laughs> i uh i do find it fascinating though that that i mean even even just a few years ago, this sort of conversation wouldn't be possible yeah, without, without the yeah. without the technology. So, especially so for that, someone like me, like I'm in, in a third world country, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that. So, so yeah, we, I, mm-hmm. no, I was just going to say when when I was a uh, when I was a boy, which was a long time ago. There were always discussions of of one day we would have phones that have television screens where you could actually look at the person you're talking to, and and they were right. and now we now we've just got that in our pocket. You know, you can just pull out your cell phone and FaceTime someone. But that was always the the dream of the modern future when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. That and we were promised uh, flying cars. We don't have those yet, though. Yeah, <laughs> flying cars. Uh, so so I um when you when we talk about like for example you you uh, about evangelism what's your mindset on it like uh, wh- what's the urgency what how much sacrifice are you willing to do and what are the what would be the cost that you would willing be willing to face you know for evangelism for evangelism hmm. uh conversations like this one that's so that's, that, what that, I, that's your that's your maximal just, thing to, just that you just can, more of a, a, a one-on-one thing yes mm-hmm. yeah it's uh it's much more personal and uh mm-hmm. and uh when when I, I was in in high school right i was a full-on christian and i was i read this book uh the the one thing you can't do in heaven right uh, mm-hmm. I think who, who who wrote that like Billy Graham, I, or or and yeah. I read that book, and so the one thing you can't do in heaven is evangelize, right? So okay. it, it it taught me that to prioritize sharing the gospel, at in my life, like to the in in, a, in the most optimal efficient way I can. So I and that and I really really fully integrated in my life. I would like to make a list of all my friends, all the people that I know, and make an actual plan on, uh, to save them. 
you know, from from hell. Because because if, if at least one of them went to, didn't get saved because of because I lacked something, it, it would be my fault. It would be on my hands, you know. So it, that that was sort of my mindset that that I, God had to use me to reach out to people, and so I I shared to everyone. I, I talked to them every opportunity I could get, but it but I started to become miserable. Because no one was, it's, it's not that no one was listening. Everyone, my, my friends were listening, you know, uh, my classmates. But I just felt that it, like it was not enough because there's so many out there in the world that that are probably going straight to hell right now because I, I am not doing my enough. So, it, so it, if, if, if one were to truly accept the fact, right, that when when you're not doing enough someone is going to hell for eternity it's horrible right it it, it, it was hell for me you know and how would right. how do you face that a truth um <clears throat> well i i think it was mark cahill that wrote that book i mm-hmm. i just pulled it up oh, okay, um awesome. um well you bring up a good point because 40 years ago here in the States, there was a heavy emphasis on, and this is going to sound a little rough, but this is just, this is my perspective on it. There were evangelism techniques that amounted to high pressure sales tactics is what it seemed to come out of. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the degree to how effective it was. And I'm not sure to the degree that it may have done damage to Christianity by producing shallow converts who didn't really stay with the faith. But you bring up a good point. You know, one of the the New Testament, one of the things the New Testament presents and and you're probably familiar with the story of in uh, john chapter four of jesus with the woman at the well yeah you know here's here's a yes here's a woman who different nation different religion different ethnic background different gender um number of things happened during the time period between the old and new testaments between the samaritans and the people in jerusalem And so here's a meeting that, um, by all indication, that really had several centuries of history bearing down on that meeting. It's not necessarily obvious from the biblical text, but when you study history, you see uh, the Samaritans and the Jews were not friendly at all. There was some bad blood between them. But Jesus makes an interesting comment to the uh, disciples as they show up um, after she had left and before she brought people from the town with her, Jesus makes a comment to them. He says, you are about to reap what you did not sow. And elsewhere in the New Testament, um, there's a phrase that says, uh, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. So, Um, I understand the position that you were in when you felt so much pressure that it was your responsibility to um, work to get people into the kingdom. Um, One of the issues with that view is the fact that um, it wasn't, it still wasn't you saving people. And I'm sorry that you had to endure that. It's still up to God to save people. But uh, the New Testament puts a high value on multiple people sharing conversations, much like this, um, that move a person from uh, a position of not knowing anything about Christianity to a position of knowing Christianity, and it may take dozens and dozens of conversations. In fact, I've seen studies 
uh, in my own studies. I've, I've done research and it may take multiple dozens of conversations mm -hmm. to move someone from unbelief mm -hmm. to making a profession. Yeah, but faith. Mark, the, the problem is, right, yes. that yes. it's not enough conversations because it, it, there will be pushback from the other side as well, you know, from Muslims, from right. cults, from right. Buddhists, right? And, right? and so if you think about the math, mathematics of it, if let's say if if all Christian countries just try to colonize all other countries with the non-Christian majority religion, then at even though there were casualties, the the <laughs> I'm sorry for talking like this, but it, if we were able to remove all the other religions and and uh, tell them about Christianity instead you would be able to save their future generations you know because what we're doing right now if you are if i'm a christian it seems that it's just not enough right well elmo i can't save anybody <laughs> any more than you can save anyone yeah i mean all, all you can do is present present the truth first of all if if god is sovereign he can bring people into someone's life and i just i mentioned you know probably a half hour ago that 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 there are reports of Jesus actually appearing to people in third world countries where they do not have access to to hear someone evangelize. So, so I, I guess we, we look at that from a different perspective, you and I. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I know you, you felt pressured and then it got overwhelming. It sounds like it. That, no, but that, that you, was the back in high school, could, of course. Well, that you couldn't do enough, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the reality still remains. It, it wasn't up to you to save someone. You, you couldn't save someone if you tried. But you could, you could tell as many people as possible. Um, that would still again, not be enough. Right. Would would it ever be possible? Do you think to to do enough? Oh, I um, I would say I guess like living an ascetic life and just set and just what do you call that? Um, you know what Jesus was asked for. You know when when he asked the man to like leave his home and sell all his possessions, you know, and give it to the poor and just follow yes. him. I think that would be actually the perfect and ideal thing for Christians to do, but that's not what anyone is doing today. And I, I would say that if there, if, if one truly did believe Christian values and teachings, then you would you would be an ascetic right now and just try to evangelize as many people as possible. You know that I that I think that would be account for a true belief in Christianity not not one hmm. where you prioritize comfort and security first and then just passively try to talk to people about Christ not no offense you know that that's just from my perspective <laughs> I have no, really no. Uh, yeah I, I don't yeah. want to be like uh, uh, not, not not like being insulting or anything or condescending that's no, just you're not my views you're not I, I didn't I don't feel that way so yeah so um no, I guess I guess we just have different views on that. Okay. Um, and, and and again, but do you I, so, think though there is an urgency to evangelism? Like every second counts, and and you have to do your part. Would you say that there is one? I I I approach it from the standpoint that there are divine encounters. Uh, where someone gets a chance to speak truth to someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, I also understand, though, about the nature of conversion. Um, I, I have. Let me give you an example. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Two examples. Number, I have a, a a close friend who's a retired pastor who has led person after person. We're talking probably hundreds of people um, led them to professions of faith in Christ. 
but he's not the person that did the planting or the watering or the sowing of seeds. He's the person that the Lord has moved into a position to find someone who is ready to make a profession of faith. It, it's almost uncanny. Um, and again, I think it comes from an understanding that there are, there are people who plant seeds. There are people who water those seeds. There are people who encourage. There are people who come in and out of another person's life. Um, and there, when the Lord, if he is sovereign, which he is, uh, he will bring about um, a profession of faith in due time. Um, plus, we know, as I've, I've said earlier, that, that um, if there is not someone um, mm -hmm. if there is not someone who come into a person's life, um, I am not willing to, to tell God he can't reach out to them uh, and have Jesus appear personally. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. um, mm -hmm. I know, but I, I understand your, your I idea about, I mean, I understand your perspective completely. Yeah. I, yeah. I do understand. I think we just disagree on how it gets done. Okay. Maybe. Awesome. Well, uh, that that was just a suggestion. You know, it doesn't really matter in the end. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. Okay. So that, well, um, uh, one last uh, topic, Mark. I, okay. I want to okay. ask you. You mentioned um, critical race theory, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is that? <laughs> I have no okay. idea what that is. Okay. <clears throat> there are. Okay, let me back up a little bit. There is an umbrella term for a number of views that desire justice and change in society, particularly American society. The umbrella, uh, the overarching view of all these views is known as critical theory. Critical theory looks for um, economic and systemic problems in a society uh, that relate from perhaps racism or mm -hmm. discrimination and seeks to remedy those through legal means. Okay? okay. So critical race theory would be a sort of like feminism, right? Well, exactly. feminism is feminism. Exactly. Feminism yeah. is one of the fields under critical theory. Okay. There's also uh, queer theory, fat theory, um, uh, critical race theory focuses on racial inequities in mm -hmm. the in the U.S. Uh, the the now there are a number of similarities between the goals of critical race theory and say Christianity. They're both opposed to oppression. There's mm -hmm. this idea of oppression, and they both seek justice. Okay, they're both seeking justice. So uh, the issue is how they go about uh, finding that justice and what they are rooted in. You know, Christianity would be uh, rooted in the teachings and ethics of Christ. Critical race theory comes or originates in critical theory which is a, an economic and law theory that comes out of the 1920s in what's known as the Frankfurt School in Austria that was looking at um, systems in Russia and wondering if they could be applied successfully elsewhere in Europe, such as Germany before um, World War II. So it's rooted in more of a human uh, humanistic uh uh, Marxist ideology, and so, so as I, as I said at the start of the show, you know, I'm I live in a in the area of Appalachia, and 60 years ago there were a number of volunteers who came into Appalachia to try to help lift it out of poverty. A number of them were from universities in the Northeast, uh, New York and Boston, and a couple other cities. And they started using words like, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of coal mining towns in this region. 
and the coal companies would would not pay their workers very well and then the um the workers couldn't shop anywhere other than the coal company stores so they were paying inflated prices so they never could escape um, the cycle of working too much and being paid too little for their labor, they were kind of stuck. And so these volunteers that came into Appalachia started using words like oppressors and oppressed, which, um, which are somewhat Marxist terms. And you find those terms that work in uh, critical race theory as well, that, um, but instead of employers being the oppressors, it might be a person of a, of a certain race that would be an oppressor. So, so, uh, so critical race theory is a, is a theory that seeks out justice for uh, inequities within uh, political and economic systems. And basically uh, uh, there are agreements between it and Christianity and there are some disagreements about how to get things done. Uh, are, there, are there issues of racism in the United States still? Yes. Uh, do we have the Civil Rights Act? Yes. Um, are there issues in systemic uh, economic policies that perhaps whites don't see, but Black Americans do experience? I would say yes. So... So we can, we can, you know, this is not a perfect society. Uh, you and I spent a lot of time this evening talking on um, just the inequities of human relations and human governments. Um, and yes, we would like to see things better. Um, I don't want to see any American uh, at an economic disadvantage to have the system rigged against you. I don't, I don't think that's fair. Uh, I don't think that's fair in Christianity or uh, particularly in capitalistic uh, endeavors. But as you and I have discussed, um, people can be greedy and people can, um, if, they, if they get a little bit of power, either politically um, or by some other means economically, um, human nature does not always seek the good. Human nature tends to look for itself. So, so uh, that that's pretty much what we'll be speaking on 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 what I'll be speaking on when it comes to critical race theory. Okay, that, so, that's awesome. Um, yep. Well, uh, Mark, I, I guess um, I want to ask you <laughs> another like last last question. Sure. Sure. Do you think? Do you think that? Uh, someone can be a true nihilist, like truly believed and live life, even though he uh, that someone knows that not, life is meaningless. I might have to think about that. Hmm. Um, I, I, I think uh, a number of people, <clears throat> excuse me, live inconsistently with their worldview. Yeah, uh, I think you don't realize yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I think I think you and I both know that there are Christians who live inconsistently with Christ's teaching. Um, I think I think if someone holds an atheistic worldview and and they view the uh, the world as not having any right and wrong, I see some consistency issues with that uh, when it comes to matters of personal. Um, uh, for example, personal justice. Um, I don't know. I've never tried to live as a nihilist. <laughs> never tried to live uh, in an existential way. I, 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 I think I'll just let it go. I think people have difficulty, all people have difficulty living up to uh, the standards which they profess. How about this? If, if, if Christianity wasn't true in the end, would you regret not living your life in, in, the, in the, the other way? Um, well, you know, Christianity rises and falls on whether the resurrection is true. Mm -hmm. 
if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Christianity is false. I mean, I have tried, um, the older I get, the more I desire to live a, a good life that seeks what is true and what is good and what is beautiful. I, I don't want to live a life of, um, of, of being, being hateful or um, not caring about my fellow man not worrying so much about uh, things or things I can buy, but, but being more concerned about how I treat people and whether they're doing well and what I can do to alleviate suffering. Um, I may fall short on that, but those are my goals. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got a, got a little tickle in my throat here. It's okay. I, I think, uh, you know, I think, you know, I think part of the problem we all see are, are people who are hypocrites. Um, you know, Christianity has its share of hypocrites, but again, the truth of Christianity doesn't depend on how its members behave. The truth of Christianity depends if, if on Jesus rising from the dead. Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians 15, if, uh, if Jesus is not risen, then your faith is useless. And I ask my students that sometimes, you know, if, if Christianity is false, why are we here? Why are we doing here? Why, why are we bothering playing church? And why are we doing all these nice things? If it's not true, then we ought to be off pursuing something else. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my belief is that Jesus did rise from the dead um, uh, based on evidences within the Bible and outside the Bible. I think the growth and spread of Christianity, I think the disciples having their own disciples, we have the writings of those disciples, a good number of them, uh, that's contained in the early church fathers. They repeat the, the teachings found in the Bible. So the Bible hasn't been changed or corrupted. Um, and we, we have evidence that some of those beliefs go back very early, uh, probably within six months of the uh, crucifixion. So um, Christians behaving badly does not mean that Christianity is false. And I think, unfortunately, that, that's kind of where a lot of the world Oh, look, there's a bunch of hypocrites doing their things. Well, that doesn't change whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. And so that that's kind of my final thought for the evening. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. but I'm, um, maybe, maybe if I come back sometime, since yeah, this is our first, first time <laughs> meeting, we've kind of covered a lot of ground. <laughs> yeah. I'm all maybe. over the place. I apologize. It's I'm just that's so right. excited. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe you can maybe you can edit down the better parts, and then when I come back, we can figure out what we're actually going to talk about. <laughs> All right, awesome. Okay. okay. Well, Mark, um, is there anything that you you uh, you want to share to the people listening? Oh, I'm just I'm just happy to finally meet you, Elmo. Right. I mean, we we talked awesome. about this a while ago, and yeah. and uh, I would just again I would just like to share that. Uh, Again, the Christians behaving badly does not necessarily mean anything uh, regarding of whether Christianity is true or not. Um, and just to keep keep searching for the truth. That's what yeah. I encourage everybody to do. Okay. I I'll, I'll okay. always will be, even though All it right. doesn't matter in the end. <laughs> <laughs> I All right, know, I'm living in contradiction. All right. Thank you, Mark uh, oh. Phillips. Thank you for being on the show. You're awesome. And uh, okay. have a great day. All right. Thank you. You too, Elmer.